My name is Olga Dmitrieva, and um, I'm a part of Colossus, so I brought this exciting presentation from Boulder, Colorado. As Matt already mentioned yesterday, Colossus worked on replications of cold fusion experiments for the last eight years. And about seven months ago, we have started something totally new. We decided to look at the numerical model of the structures that are based on the experimental data have exhibited cold fusion reaction. So LNR friendly materials. Before I go any further, I want to say and emphasize one more time. I'm not going to talk about modeling of cold fusion. What we did, we did numerical simulations of the chemical environment of those LNR friendly materials. Why? First of all, um, because these days when computational power is not simply accessible but now relatively affordable, we believe that we can do a quick scan of those materials to see what properties do they exhibit so we can emphasize, I mean, we can, we can bring these properties, we can measure, we can, we can try to simulate something new, something that will favor LNR even more. So, for these purposes, uh, we use the open source software, Quantum Espresso. It is um, a very powerful package. What we did, we did the electronic structure calculations and material modeling based on the density functional theory. This software is very, very widely used by um, condensed matter physicists in the chemical and pharmaceutical industry. So it's not something unknown that we have discovered. And as I already mentioned, before we started, <coughs> we looked at those um, And those key properties or key environments, key um, nuclear active environment uh, points, and probably you will agree with me, uh, one of them is the high loading ratio of hydrogen and palladium. It seems like the presence of dopants or impurities play a big role. And we have heard so many times for these two days, and we're going to hear it again, structural morphology. Structural morphology is important. So I will show you how using this software we can model all three of uh, these components, and um, I'll obviously show you the results of those simulations. How do we evaluate? Is it uh, material good, or is this configuration not? that effective, we had to come up with figures of merit. And one of them, we decided to use a hydrogen absorption energy. Most of the simulations you will see, uh, we did with surfaces. So absorption hydrogen, I mean, hydrogen absorption energy of the surface can be um, a good a measurement tool. Another figure of merit we have borrowed from Peter Heigelstein. Uh, he showed for the last couple of years there was a very interesting talk he presented about the monovacancies in the bulk palladium. And when he talked about those monovacancies, he looked at the separation of two hydrogen atoms and how close they can get to each other within a lattice. So obviously closer they come, uh, higher the probability of the reaction. You probably already noticed I'm saying hydrogen even though I had deuterium in the title of my talk. From the, simulations point, from the simulation point of view, hydrogen and deuterium are indistinguishable for this specific calculations. For the other calculations, there will be difference. But now I will be talking, I will be saying hydrogen, so please you can actually apply this to deuterium too. So we will start with this first box high loading ratio, and when I, when, when I will be showing you the plots, uh, the figure of merit for this um, part will be the absorption <coughs> energy. So 
So what you see here is the surface of palladium metal with some hydrogen absorbed on that surface. So that was modeled uh, for 100 crystal plane. Why did we pick it up? Because uh, Vittorio Villante <coughs> was saying that this crystal plane seems like be crucial for the successful um, cold fusion replication. So we, de we decided to go with 100. We, begin we began with 100 crystal plane. And what is plotted here is the energy of absorption of the hydrogen on 100 palladium crystal plane. So the energy of absorption is negative, which means hydrogen will be absorbed. What happens when we start <coughs> loading our crystal lattice with more hydrogen? So you can see I'm adding one hydrogen in the sublayer first, then I'm adding one on the surface, and then on the surface and sublayer. And the absorption energy is reducing. Now I'm going to fully load the palladium lattice. And the absorption energy is reduced four times. Why is it important? We were not the first one who discovered that. People already looked at the hydrogen loading and how does it affect the um, absorption energy. It is a very important quality for the catalytic, catalytic chemists. But as a result of the hydrogen loading, the mobile atomic hydrogen now is weakly binded to the surface and available for reaction. So this is equally important for the chemists. For those who study the catalysts, it's also important for us because mobile atomic hydrogen now is available for reaction, chemical reaction, or maybe the reaction that we are interested in. But sometimes, and the experimentalists know that it's hard to load palladium with hydrogen. And there is another way to lower that absorption energy. That is where the dopants and impurities come to the picture. This part of study was inspired by the cluster of very interesting publications. Um, one that I reference came out in 2004 and was published in uh, Nature Materials. Once again, chem, chem, that was uh, more in the area of the catalytic chemistry. So what was found is that when we're talking about the alloys, and those alloys are not uniform, and for example, I simulated here two pictures. One is the top view, another one is a side view, where the gray atoms are host and pink atoms are solute. If the solute is not uniform across the material, and we have a higher concentration in this near surface area, then interestingly enough, we still have the low hydrogen dissociation energy, but absorption energy is reduced, exactly the same effect that we can uh, get by loading lattice with hydrogen. So this data I got from the paper I just mentioned, so this is from the reference, and I just want to show you what exactly do I mean. We have four pure metals, and that's their absorption energy. Now we're going to start mixing them, making alloys. And not just alloys, but those near-surface alloys. So for these three mixes, you can see the absorption energy being reduced tremendously. All right, we are interested in some other elements, those elements that can come to the play during our electrochemical experiments. So let's look what's going to happen to those. They are in red on this right side of the slide. And we just took uh, lithium, boron, oxygen, fluorine, um, 
organics, chlorine, arsenic, and all of them really reduced the absorption energy. So the substitutional or interstitial sublayer doping reduces hydrogen absorption energy. I just showed that. And uh, if reaching the high hydrogen loading ratios is impossible, some of those dopants can really help us. And the sublayer doping can be used to reduce absorption energy to allow hydrogen to move more freely along the surface. And once again, make it available for the reaction. I am up to the last part, and that is the structural morphology. So, what I mean by the structural morphology, voids, cracks, dislocations, the surface morphology. That is actually how we started seven months ago. What we did, we looked at the study that was presented by Peter Heidelstein and um, NRL computational physicists did the calculations. Peter looked at the monovacancy in the bulk palladium and showed that if two hydrogen are placed in the bulk, they can really come close together, much closer if they wouldn't, if they would, if no vacancy is present. So the numbers were close to one angstrom. That is the HH separation in that molecule. I just want to remind you that in vacuum, the regular hydrogen molecule will form at 0.76 angstrom distance. So it is more than uh, the value in vacuum, but it's still much closer than in any other occasion. So we took this study a little bit further, or let's say we modified it. I am showing you the surface again, and now my monovacancy is in the sublayer, in the sublayer region. So once again, the 100 plane and two hydrogen atoms travel from the surface towards the monovacancy. And we're gonna stop at several points and let the system relax and see what would be the hydrogen separation at each of those points. So we're looking for the minimum of total energy of the system. So three cases we studied. The first one, when the lattice doesn't have any hydrogen in it, so it's pure palladium. Then we will see what will change if we add hydrogen atoms. We fully load our cell. And next one, the last one, is when we also introduce the dopants, fluorine in this case. So the first plot, pure palladium. So what is plotted here is the distance from the surface towards the monovacancy. This is surface. That's where the monovacancy is. And that is the separation of that hydrogen molecule. It reaches 0.8 something extra. So here's the separation in the vacuum. So yes, those two hydrogen atoms can get closer together in the area of the monovacancy. But look what's gonna happen if we load our crystal lattice with hydrogen. So that separation been lowered, and at the point of the monovacancy, we hit the vacuum level. When I'm saying vacuum level, means separation in the vacuum. So that was the second case. What about the third case when we start doping palladium? Here we are. So at the point of the monovacancy, we're actually even closer than we would be if the molecule sits in vacuum. I picked up fluorine for those simulations. And uh, why did I do that? The fluorine is the element with the highest electronegativity. And actually the idea of trying different elements with different electronegativity came from Tom Bernard. He will be talking tomorrow at noon. So what's plotted here is 
the electronegativity of the elements with, with which we used to dope our crystal lens. So when you see palladium here, it means palladium in palladium, which means it's, it's just pure lens. But everything else means we're adding the dopants. So whenever we add fluorine with the highest electronegativity, we get the lowest HH separation. <coughs> So this black bars, that is the study on the surface, which I just showed. The light gray ones, that's the separation which was calculated for the bulk monovacancy, the way Peter <coughs> and Louis Char did it. So based on that, HH separation can be decreased by higher hydrogen palladium loading or by doping the sublayer. And the HH separation at monovacancy depends on electronegativity of the doping elements and can reach 0.72 angstroms. So right now we are in the process of arranging some uh, material fabrication. So we we'll have our palladium doped with fluorine and uh, we'll start using it in the experimental work. So the overall conclusions. The quantum espresso allows quick scan of potential nuclear active environment in transition, in transition metal alloys. Hydrogen loading is confirmed to reduce the absorption energy in the same way as near surface alloys. What does it mean? <coughs> it means hydrogen is mobile on the surface and we are increasing the probability of reaction. HH, HH separation can be decreased even more by introducing either defects or chemical dopants based on the electronegativity effects. And there's much, much more that can be done with this powerful software. So it is definitely a work in progress. Uh, and that will be my last slide. <coughs> so please proceed with questions. Um, we know what happens when two, we bring two neurons close together because this has been done using muons. And when muons bring two neurons close together, they fuse, fair enough. But hot fusion results, always hot fusion, never cold fusion. Now, if you're trying to explain cold fusion this way, it would seem to be counter to that observation. If you're trying to explain hot fusion, then we have a different issue. So the question is, how does this produce cold fusion, if you assume that it does? I will be conservative by answering this question. And I refer to the very first and probably sentences uh, with which I started this presentation. We, we do not model or explain cold fusion. We just show what happens if we model those materials that seem to be favoring LNR. So that is something, some environment, which has been showed by some experimental results, is LNR friendly. It's also hot fusion friendly. <laughs> I mean, if there's something personal against hot fusion? <laughs> That's something I can't cover. <laughs> uh, Ed, I would love to go through those slides and talk to you about this. I also have some updates on uh, the calculations. We did some calculations for Ed, Rex, Theory, too. Uh, Go to the next question. Okay. Mm. Go. Peter. Olga. Uh, yes. Olga, um, are you going to continue this uh, line of research and go on to do the same thing for nickel alloys? It would be very useful if you did. Absolutely, and our plans are even more ambitious. So, uh, Matthew mentioned the chart for the loading of nickel and <coughs> the same chart we have for palladium. So it would be very interesting 
not just experimentally showed the results of hydrogen loading in plating or nickel, but also supported with the software simulations that would be awesome. So that's pretty ambitious plans, but uh, absolutely studying of the different alloys, nickel-based plants. Yes. Yeah, can you tell me, does this software allow us to calculate the energy level of a single hydrogen impurity relative to the bearing level? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll probably answer it a little bit differently, and, and then you'll tell me if I answered your question or not. Uh, as a result of calculation in the output file, you have a total energy of the system, and you have your Fermi energy. So if I work with this huge supercell, it will show me the total energy and the Fermi energy. Or I can take just one atom and run the same file and it will show me the total energy of the atom and its Fermi energy. Could we run the whole ensemble with the hydrogen ionized and the hydrogen not ionized? That will require messing up with some <clears throat> inner sort of a settings which I'm not comfortable doing right now. So I'm not, yeah, well, I, 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 don't, right I, I don't have a, so may, maybe it can be done. I just don't know how. <laughs> I don't know yet. Yeah, I, I like your talk very much. Um, Lou DiCero and I have been cooperating on uh, modeling. One of the problems is the quantum espresso solves the 3D Schrodinger wave equation. And as a consequence, it can't actually represent fully ionized hydrogen. As a consequence of that, um, I suggested to Lou to try to use partially ionized lithium to see if it in fact would migrate and would behave the same way. So it's essentially an ersatz way of modeling it. So this may actually answer the question That's, for you too. That, that, that is, that is yeah. exactly true. So I think it requires some messing up with student credentials, which I'm not comfortable doing. But it doesn't mean that it can't be done. I wonder if it's now or it's terribly difficult to model uh, uh, other bases on the base or if you can use one uh, plus fax structures. Well, it's, it's, I'd like to say it's not a problem because, yes, uh, we already have files for different configurations for 100, 111. We can relax them in the different. Uh, planes and study different crystallographic configurations. Well, so it doesn't have to be cubes or... Uh... Uh, keep in mind, I'm sorry, I'm going to take like 30 seconds, that even, even though I showed you those supercells, you have to turn on your imag imagination <laughs> and just think about this as a three-dimensional picture. So those cells yeah. will go in all three dimensions. So that is why if we come up with some weird configuration which doesn't have any symmetry, the system will still treat it as a symmetrical structure because it will just take this one unit like a unit cell, right? And it will just replicate it in all three directions. It's a planar unit cell. Yes, but if you work with big enough unit cell, if you work, if you work with big enough supercell, then yes, you can model something, something really weird. And uh, I'm sorry, a very last remark. Uh, if you have in mind any interesting configurations you want to try, please come over and talk to us because it may be like five, four, six hours of computing time. That's it. It's, it's, it that, it's not maybe even that difficult just to feed this to the computer and see what the results are. Thank you.